All right. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we're here. Well, I'm here. Lance Conley isn't going to be able to make it tonight. He's got some um, he's got some prior commitments that he has to make. But I'm over here and I'm doing another um, another interview. I've got a guest tonight whose name may not be familiar to you or maybe it is familiar. His name is Tristan Gabriel, and he's been pretty active on the Internet over the last, I would say, probably year or so. I've seen him post a lot of comments um, in regards to the IO system of doctrine. Um, you might have interacted with him under the name um, 21st Century Mind, and uh, he's pretty active. He's also, I've also seen him on uh, Jason DaCosta's channel. He's very knowledgeable in the system, in the Israel-only system of doctrine. He has quite a bit of insight to share on that system of doctrine. So what I want to do is welcome him to the show. Hi, Tristan. How are you? Doing well. How are you? Doing great. Thank you. Doing great. So I guess I guess I could I could open this up by just asking you a little bit of your background and how you got into this system uh, of of Israel-only doctrine. How you became how you uh, came to embrace the system as the truth. Well, first, I was uh, born and raised in the United Pentecostal Church, uh, you know, very zealous denomination. Um, you know, I, I grew up in the church. I went to Bible college for the four years uh, to take your to get your bachelor's degree. I went to seminary with the Assemblies of God, um, was a former licensed minister with the UPCI. Um, I just uh, started studying more eschatology. I mean, our denomination was staunch dispensationalist. You know, I taught and preached staunch dispensationalism. And, you know, um, it wasn't until I started seeing just errors in, in doctrines as a whole, like particularly um, the, the doctrine of tithing, I, I thought was very unbiblical. I started seeing a lot of the exegetical er, er, errors in my denomination, um, as, namely with, with eschatology. Um, I was introduced to Don Preston uh, from a friend of mine um, who actually converted to Eastern Orthodox, uh, just, I want to say about a couple of years ago, he was a former full pret. And, uh, he introduced me to Don Preston. I want to say about maybe four years ago. And, uh, it, you know, it takes a while to, uh, you know, you learn one thing, one way your whole life since you were born. And then, you know, you're, it's like a, like a train, you have a train doesn't just stop immediately. It takes time to stop. And then you got to go reverse back, you know? So once I saw the full preterist paradigm, then I started asking the essential questions like how is salvation for us today if the gospel mission is completed? If the great commission to go and reach all nations um, has been completed like full preterism states, um, then there could not be logically, biblically a gospel message in the future. So if there is a gospel message in the future, then that's futurism. If Adam's curse is still in the future, forever binding on all humanity, that's futurism. Um, if there's an eternal judgment, like, for example, hell or Sheol, where the worm dieth not, the fire doesn't quench, if that is what we're comprehending as hell, that's forever in the future as well. So I started seeing the inconsistencies of full preterism. <clears throat> um, then I was uh, introduced to IO uh, through a Facebook group. Um, I did listen to Jason DaCosta. And I'm just persuaded that uh, the IO view is the full, complete, true version of full preterism. Um, I just don't believe that when a full preterist say that all things are fulfilled. Well, if all things are fulfilled, then what we're reading is just a historical narrative of Israel's Messiah. Um, whether it is historical or whether it's mythological, I think is up for discussion. Um, but that's how I came across the IO view. Um, I also believe that if IO is true, I think that it lines up with a lot of philosophical investigations that humanity um, all throughout history has always pondered, like, for example, the existence of evil, um, the hiddenness of God. Um, you know, if, if I were to talk to any futurist and I were to say, well, if the God of Israel is still in humanity today, interacting with humanity, where is the God of Israel throughout all of church history? I mean, you have the Roman Catholic Church doing these diabolical crimes against humanity and from what we know from the god of israel in the old testament is that god brings judgment to those who bear his name and it was the roman catholic church who bore his name um, throughout church history the catholic church the holy roman empire with charlemagne these were the primary christians that the world would see they're the ones who claim to give us the 27 books that we have in our canon so why isn't god judging the catholic church like he judged israel why is he not 
destroying their cathedrals, like how God destroyed the temple in the Old Testament. How come he didn't do it like he did in the New Testament? Where is this character that we see in the Old Testament, this 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 divine being that loves its people and also will judge it if judge them if they are rebellious or do something antithetical to his commandments. So I see the absence of the God of Israel throughout church history. I also see an absence of the gifts of the spirit, uh, which when we read the book of Acts, we see that that was an empowerment. First Corinthians 12. I mean, I grew up Pentecostal. You know, I mean, uh, people have been claiming to perform these biblical miracles my whole life. I have not seen a, a true biblical miracle, somebody who's a leper being healed with one touch, shadows being passed by uh, and healing people, um, you, know, you know, these these type of phenomena. But nonetheless, um, supernatural agents, angels, demons, um, whatever it is that we want to call them, these transcendent agents, you know, philosophy also um, has an explanation to why these things exist. Um, and there's trying, they're trying to have some scientific breakthrough as well, but I just see that the practical implications of IO, um, seems to put all of philosophy and science together. So that's, that's, that's my, that's my view. I mean, I can go on and on, but I'd love to hear some questions. I'd love to have some interaction. Right. Well, thank you for that introduction, uh, Tristan. And, uh, I, you know, I, I've dealt I haven't really dealt too much with IO in the past couple of years, but I've dealt with a lot of people who have said, you know, watch out for IO, you know, don't, you know, if, if they come on your channel, you know, block them. If they, if they try to start a conversation with you, you seem very wary of having any conversations with you guys. And I've sort of had, I guess I've had some interactions within the past couple of years, but they've been very minimal. I haven't had, had a whole lot of time, but I kind of understand your position. And I guess I, I got to ask you at this point, why do you think the ant, this antipathy exists between, say, um, just, you know, your regular uh, garden variety full preterists and, say, someone like yourself who just takes it that extra you know, that extra mile or that extra few yards? Why, why does that antipathy exist? I, I, I wouldn't speak on anybody why, you know, the I of you people could have such, you know, a, as you said, you know, antipathy. I, I just, um, maybe perhaps, uh, I'll just speak for myself, born and raised in the church, it's very difficult for people to get outside of their traditional views or something that they've held on so, so tightly. So, you know, in a precious manner that they wouldn't want to relinquish that. I mean, there's a lot of reasons why somebody would say, oh, stay away from IO because it leads to atheism or it leads to agnosticism, whatever have you. Um, I just don't believe that IO has to lead to atheism. Um, you can still believe that the God of Israel still exists in humanity today. The only logical question would be is then where is the God of Israel? Who is he departing the Red Sea for? The, the who is he killing the firstborn for um you know who is he bringing manna down from heaven for we don't see this 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 deity and its character at all historically intervening in humanity what about the holocaust i mean so many orthodox jews uh, quite a bit actually became agnostic and, and, and atheist after that so you know I, I don't understand why somebody would not give the io view um a, you know a fair chance maybe confused uh, probably with the Gentiles, perhaps that kind of goes against what is just in mainstream Christianity, what's taught about the identity of the Gentiles. The the Israel only view declares that the Pauline epistles, um, the the audience that's there are scattered paganized Israelites that Paul is writing to. And and in, in my opinion, when we're looking at the scripture, I think we have to have epistemic interest in mind. You know, we often use the term hermeneutics, hermeneutics. Well, hermeneutics derived from the study of epistemology. And I think that if we look at the epistemic criteria, whether it's reliabilism, internalism, externalism, coherentism, whatever it is, I think that we have to have respect for the text, not to add to the text and not to take away from the text. And um, when we're looking at the New Testament, what makes sense to me is Paul is using these Old Testament passages of scripture that was exclusively given to Israel. We could pull them all, the, all throughout the Old Testament. Paul even re refers to them. I mean, you can find a commentary now and, and see the cross reference. It's so easy nowadays. But Paul is using these Old Testament scriptures. How, how I was always reading it throughout the years was he's using it in a spiritual allegorical sense. I think like right at 
prima facie, you're reading this, and if you have any familiarity with the Old Testament, you go, well, why is Paul using these Old Testament passages of scripture? It seems to be like he's taking them out of a context or he's spiritualizing, allegorizing them with his apostolic authority to do so. And in some cases that that is true. But if he's talking to true pagan Israelites, he's using these Old Testament passages of scripture and applying it to, let's say, Native Americans. All right. That's what we're that's what we're doing today. I mean, here, here we are in the United States of America. And the colonists came with Paul's letters. And if they were to read, you know, Colossians 2 and 3, if they were to read 1 Corinthians 10, if they were to read Romans and, and see that these, that, that, that these Old Testament passages of Scripture are being applied to a group of people, I just don't see how those Old Testament passages of Scripture could be applied to anybody other than the Israelites. And so Paul is either hyper-spiritualizing the text to fit the uh, a doctrine to true pagans, or he's using those Old Testament passages and applying it to the seed of Abraham or those of whom the promises and the inheritance was given to. So in my opinion, if you look at it within that paradigm, like, okay, let, let's just pretend that the Gentiles in the New Testament uh, were the scattered paganized Israelites. Well, then that would make sense why Paul is using the Old Testament who was given to the seed of Abraham, given to Israelites, and he's applying it rightly so to them without having to hyper spiritualize or allegorize the text. And I'll just I'll end it with this. Romans 11, for example, I think is the, the main proof text for Io. Um, Paul was talking about when the fullness of the Gentiles are brought in, all Israel would be saved. And that Israel, in my opinion, has to be none other than first century Israel that Paul had in mind. Um, you know, Jesus said he came for the lost sheep of Israel. Um, you know, Jesus would say things like, um, you know, you will not go throughout all the houses of Israel to the son of man comes, you know, Acts 1, well, when will you restore the kingdom of, Is of, of Israel? Um, and you see that Israel, every time it's mentioned in the New Testament, is always first century Israel. That's in the mind of the original author. That's the mind of the original audience. I don't see where Romans 11, where it's not a first century Israel. Of course, the dispensationalists will say, well, that's 1948 Israel, some sort of Israel in the future. But I think right at face value, when Paul said all Israel will be saved, that that was none other than first century Israel. And if the full number of the chosen elect Gentiles, whoever they were, if they were true pagan Gentiles, fine. If, if we want to believe they were the scattered Israelites, I believe that there's warrant for that belief as well. But regardless, if the fullness of the Gentiles is already completed and come to pass, which would result in first century Israel being saved, then that, that's it. Game over. I mean, there's no need for the gospel mission then. Um, if Israel is saved and the full number of the Gentiles, which we would say is you and I, non-Jews, non-Israelites, if they have already been brought in, well, then that's it. I mean, it, it, to me, it wouldn't matter much, um, you know, if some esoteric passages in Revelation that may say, well, this could be a futuristic, you know, gathering or the everlasting gospel and you know, the millennial reign, things like that. I just don't put warranted belief on a highly symbolic book that no human has ever been fully to grasp. I rather put warranted belief, put the evidence in the clear cut statements that we read in the scripture, that which we can understand um, and that we can coherently verify, at least with with other minds, just to get some justified true belief. Right. And it seems like, uh, Tristan, that you're right. It seems like if you if you apply that principle of audience relevance, you're going to get come to the inevitable conclusion that it had to be fulfilled within that time frame. And I think even um, I want to say even, you know, teachers like Gary DeMar and others, you know, not not what you would call full preterist, but, you know, pretty, pretty close to that mark. They even stress that principle of audience relevance, but then they become inconsistent in their application of that principle. And so in this, in one passage, they'll say, well, that was just to them. And then in another passage that was written to the same exact audience, they'll say, well, no, 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 this applies to us. So I, I'm sure that you see a lot of that inconsistency in your, um, you know, in your forays through throughout the internet. And you see some of that. And so you're honing in on that and saying, hey, you know, you have to take this principle and be consistent with it. Do you think that audience relevance is the foundation, as it were, of the uh, Israel only paradigm? Oh, absolutely. And also with audience relevance, there's also linguistic relevance, which I think is very important because, you know, Matthew 24 through 25 
in my opinion, is the foundation of the eschaton. I mean, here are the clear cut statements that we see from the head honcho, the chief, the master, the Lord himself. Um, and I don't see any scientific or neurological justification from what we know how the language uh, or how the brain processes language. I don't see how we can scientifically um, put a divide within the Olivet Discourse. Like I know many people would say verse 36 in Matthew 24, no man knows the day or the hour. That could be a division. But Jesus does not explicitly state what I'm telling you is applied to you and another generation far in the distance future in a different dimension of space time. This part of the eschaton is applied for them. He does not specifically state that. So I think that we can rightly assume that he is talking to them. Audience relevance, linguistic relevance is still applied to them. And their brains would not have cognitively understood these prophetic state of affairs to go beyond 70 AD or to go beyond their lifetime. If so, and I, I actually have asked Lance Conley this, and maybe he didn't see this part of the question, of can can he or anybody who believes in futurism provide any scholastic linguistical sources that somebody can, what I like to say, talk to them, but through them. Like I'm talking to you about the eschaton, but I'm actually speaking through you, through which later would be a book that billions of people would read all throughout church history. And here we are today, like a, a spiritual type of talking, this metaphysical type of talking, which, you know, when people say it's a spiritual application, what they're saying, it's a, it's a non-scientific application. It's something that defies the laws of physics. So even just from a linguistical or neurological standpoint, if, if I were to read Matthew 24 and 25 and I had no knowledge of Christianity, no presupposition, I read it right at prima facie, I don't see any linguistical scholar, I don't see any neurologist at, at all saying, yes, look, here's text proof right here where Jesus directly and specifically addresses a much further generation uh, and his intention was for parts of the eschaton to extend beyond their lifetime and their reality. Right. And I've often noted uh, to Lance and also to myself in my own studies that it seems like everything's compressed into a time frame. You know, it's compressed into that 40 year time period. So what do you make of church history? Because we know that, you know, after AD 70, we've got documents which come pretty close to uh, having possibly been written after the destruction of Jerusalem, in which seems like they're still waiting, you know, still business as usual. It's still, you know, the church is still uh, spreading the gospel, you know, people are still uh, coming to into the into the fold. Um, you know, they're still looking for the second coming. What do you, and I know you're probably going to say, well, because it's, you know, it all ended, but is there, is there a, is there, I guess, a master a response to that as far as what's what, where do we get what do we how do we explain away the 2000 years since when people were obviously they were considered themselves true Christians, they considered themselves saved they considered, I mean, it, Christianity, um, I guess institutional Christianity might have brought a lot of, you know, wars and, and conflict into the world. But then there was that other side of Christianity where people were you know, it also brought a lot of, you know, order and a lot of harmony into society. So what would you, how would you explain that aspect of church history? Well, I think that if Israel only is true, let's, this, let's say it's warranted true belief, um, then that means that humanity has been deceived this entire time. I mean, that is the only conclusion that we can come to. And, you know, it's not a new thing for humanity to be deceived by a religious text. Uh, let's look at Islam, for example. You have those who are willing to be martyred, um, just like the Christian martyrs. Um, that that goes into the question on whether or not the Bible is historical or is it mythological. Um, me personally, I've come to the conclusion that perhaps this is probably a myth. Um, and the reason why I say that um, is because when I read the Old Testament, uh, the supernatural events that we read, like, for example, Samson. Samson was this very strong man, very similar to Hercules. Um, Hercules, we'd say, is a myth, but with Hebraic history, this has to be historically true. I don't think, I think that's extreme relativism, in my opinion. If you're to look at all the civilizations throughout history, um, and you can see that, hey, um, using like these mythological, hyperbolic, supernatural events within their history, that's something that ancient humans did at that time period. In the New Testament, 
the rapture, catching away of the saints would be no different than Elijah being caught up or Enoch being caught up. Um, the resurrection, obviously, we believe that it already took place. I, I personally believe that Paul was referring to a physical bodily resurrection. Someone's going to say, well, where's the history of all these people being raptured up? Where's the history? And, you know, what's amazing is that Christians who want to challenge that, well, if the rapture took place and Jesus returned in bodily form and, and he took them up into a, a spiritual kingdom, New Jerusalem, then where's the history of it? Well, notice that Christians now become the skeptics because it's the skeptics who question the historicity of the Old Testament, whether David existed, whether Solomon existed, whether Noah's Ark took place. And I find it you know, amusing that Christians now, when it comes to the New Testament supernatural events, now they demand history in order for them to put their faith in that belief. Uh, it's the consistency. If if in the Old Testament, if I in my in my heart and in my mind, I believe, well, these are just tale like folklore legends. I just that's how I would view the New Testament. Um, and and to bring conclusion to your question, um, yes, throughout church history, it would have to be that humanity has been deceived this entire time. Oh, and let me just add this one point. Let me give me one second. Mateo, Mateo, go to your room. Hi. Go to your room, please. Sorry, it's, it's my. Uh, I, I um, I, I like to also like to say this with the the scattered Israelites. Um, that is the primary center of the eschaton with the Israel only view. And if futurism is is let's say it's true, then that means that the scattered Israelites are still out in the nations today. Because I don't see any Christian groups going out on an outreach saying, let's go and find the lost sheep of Israel. Let's go find those that were paganized during the intertestamental period. Let's go on an outreach and try to find them because Jesus said he came only for them. I mean, that is a very, very powerful proposition that we read in the text that Jesus exclusively came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And we don't see salvation of true pagan Gentiles all throughout the Gospels. As a matter of fact, we don't see the salvation of the Gentiles until Acts 10 with Cornelius and his kinsmen. Um, that was around 10 to 15 years after the day of Pentecost, according to scholarship. So even Jesus had this Israel only view, um, even with the Great Commission, because you know, I always wondered, OK, if Jesus said to go and teach all nations, go and, and teach, baptize in them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, then why were uh, why was Peter confused when the Gentiles got the Holy Spirit? Uh, why weren't they preaching to true pagans from Acts 2 and Day of Pentecost all the way to Acts 10? Uh, I, I could expound more on that, but that, that's to answer the question. Historically speaking, um, yeah, uh, humanity has been deceived. Uh, that would have to be the, the, the only conclusion. Um, and if futurism is still warranted, then, to, then the scattered Israelites have been all throughout the nations this entire time. And I don't see the Roman Catholic Church or any denomination taken on that purpose, that mission that Jesus said he was going to go and gather them. I don't see that happening all throughout church history. Right. And, you know, I've listened to different, um, you know, different podcasts on, you know, like myth vision and, and stuff like that, where I, I guess there's, um, there's a lot of new views that are starting to set in, you know, to the effect that, you know, maybe the, the historical writings, maybe the New Testament writings, maybe, you know, the writers had their own specific you know, agendas in framing those stories. And what I want to ask you now is how does, um, because, you know, Paul spoke of that he, he was, you know, taught his um, readers to look for a resurrection. And so he was, the way he was expressing it was as if, you know, dead bodies were going to come out of the ground, were going yeah. to be raised from the dead. Now, do you think that that's just, do you think that that's what they were actually looking for? Or do you think that takes on a more spiritual meaning, say like, something that perhaps like Don Preston would teach you know, the corporate body view or something like maybe the uh, immortal body at death view, or do you take that literally as a literal uh, resurrection that they were looking for, but something that just didn't happen that failed perhaps because of a failed ap apocalypticism? How do you view? I respectfully disagree with Don Preston and many of the full press view of the resurrection. I mean, they're trying to overly spiritualize, uh, overly allegorize something. Obviously, it is a corporate bodily resurrection. But if you look at what the resurrection was consistently, Jesus it was raised from the dead. Lazarus was raised from the dead. When Jesus uh, uh, rose from the dead, the scripture states that many of the Old Testament saints rose with him and went into the city. Um, and I just think that the grammar of 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about different bodies, celestial bodies, flesh of animals, birds, yada, yada, yada. No flesh can inherit the kingdom of God. And 
we who are alive and remain will be caught up, you know, together to meet him. And, and all, to me, it's, it's a Paul intended a physical resurrection uh, to be like Christ. If Jesus rose from the dead, I mean, that was the promise. That was part of the inheritance that, you know, those that were uh, saved, um, you know, from the curse of Adam, uh, saved from the curse of the law, um, that they would uh, inherit uh, a body just like Jesus. They would be like him. They would be glorified like him. Um, and that was to be the age to come, you know, where Jesus said they would never marry or give into marriage. They would be like the angels in heaven. Um, and Jesus, you know, said that he would raise them up on the last day. And the full preterist paradigm is pretty much the last day was 70 AD. The final judgment was 70 AD. The Lamb's Book of Life was 70 AD. Right when the earthly temple was destroyed, you have this new Jerusalem, this, 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 this inheritance for this supernatural people. Um, for a supernatural place, because to me, that's that's just what was promised to them. They would be immortal. They would have immortal bodies. I mean, I just think it's so clear. I don't think that any, um, you know, any linguistical scholar, um, any literary scholar would read that and and believe, uh, you know, the resurrection that that Don Preston teaches. That even Sam Frost formerly taught and saw, you know, even wrote a book about it and just saw that it's incorrect. Um, so yes, I do take I do take that to be true. Now, whether they they looked for that and it was historical, I think that's just another debate. But without a doubt, um, yes, it was a physical resurrection. Right, and so that's what I've always thought as well. And um, it's just, I guess, the idea is there's an underlying concept of failed apocalypticism. So, and I mean, this is you know, there's many scholars that take that view as well. So it's not like you know a fringe view anymore. Now it's sort of like. A position which is accepted within certain um, circles of academia. So, would you say the majority? I mean, I guess I'm asking for a consensus view. Would you say that the consensus view among IO adherents is that the um, that the eschatological hope of the first century saints was a failed hope, or would you say that it was a realized hope? What would be your position within that uh, within that spectrum of thought? Whether it was a failed hope, I think that if these events were historical and if they actually took place, then they were fulfilled when Christ returned for the elect, for that those body of believers who would be raptured up, who would inherit that promise. Um, maybe I'm misunderstanding your question, but I do believe that they hoped for this resurrection, but they also expected this resurrection to take place in their lifetime because there's no explicit statement. I think this is a very, very strong point. If we were in court and, you know, we're going against a prosecution, there's a judge, there's a jury, anybody would ask, well, did Paul specifically state that the resurrection would take place beyond their lifetime? And I would say, no, we don't have a specific statement. All of the propositions that we're reading was written directly to them. Um, and I just don't see where there's a breakage in space time because, you know, the full preterists talk about time statements, time statements, time statements. Uh, we know scientifically that with time comes space, the time and space continuum. So if we're going to divide the language into a different generation, let's say our generation, then that's 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 going against the space-time continuum. We're, we're bringing space-time continuum and those state of affairs that were to happen then, and we're bringing it into another dimension. I don't know where we do that with any other book. I mean, I, I can't think of any other historical book or a novel that I read or anybody reads and says, well, these statements were applied to them, but now they're applied to us or to some other generation without an explicit clear cut statement that says otherwise. So that's to me, if I were just to look at this, just from you know the modicum of education that I've had, um, I would say, look, there's no textual evidence of a specific breakage of the text where Paul intended these prophetic state of affairs to take place in another dimension of time and space. He does not specifically state that. And I just don't believe that the apostles preached an ambiguous return of Christ. I believe that they preached an unambiguous return of Christ, that it was for sure going to take place to be ready, to be sanctified, mind, body, and soul, and spirit. And it could happen at any time. Sell all your possessions if you have to. Those that are, are thinking about getting married, I would rather have you not get married, you know, because the time is short. It's, go, it's going to happen. And obviously, we know Bertrand Russell's critique um, that if it didn't take place, well, then he deceived them and he's making them believe that it was going to take place. But really, like, like I said before, Jesus and the apostles are talking to them, but through them. He's talking to them, but what was intended was 
to spiritually speak through a, a, a canon of 27 books, a volume of a book to go throughout all of humanity, throughout all of the church ages up until the time period. I think uh, John MacArthur says so that every generation could be on the tiptoe of expectation. And that right there is just it's inferential. We don't we don't see the apostle saying, well, parts of the eschaton are intended for humanity to be on the tiptoe of expectation. That is an, an only an inference. And I don't believe that sound doctrines can be based off of inferences alone. I think that sound doctrines have to have textual evidence. They have to have written propositions that are exclusive within the text in order to fit the criteria of a sound doctrine. Right. How, how do you think um, IO, do you, do you think IO has any bearing on the doctrine of biblical inerrancy? For example, we know that the, uh, we know that within Protestantism, uh, there is a prevailing belief that the scriptures are inerrant. Therefore, we can authoritatively prove, I guess, uh, through inference or through, through another uh, rational process that this or, or that happens or is going to happen or that this or that doctrine is true or isn't true. But now, if I guess what I'm trying to ask you is, how does IO deal with the doctrine of inerrancy? Because if there was a failed eschatological hope, if perhaps, you know, that maybe Bertrand Russell was right, and maybe, you know, Jesus didn't know, or maybe he did deceive his, you know, his followers, how would that impact the doctrine of inerrancy? Because we know that if uh, the Christ's words are not true, then we can't trust anything. We can't trust the scriptures or anything. So how would you construct a system of theology on a, on a, um, on a, a set of scriptures which are not which are not inerrant do you think that has any bearing on the doctrines of io do you, i mean do you accept the doctrine no, i don't i don't think it has any i don't think it has any bearings i mean i'm sure people may disagree i just think whether we're looking at this as historical or if it's mythological i think that that is the dividing point i mean we can scrutinize the gospel of mark and this becomes into an entirely different world we're not even talking about eschatology anymore we're talking about like you said the inerrancy of the text um, I, me personally, um, I've done some research on the trustworthiness of uh, Mark, um, you know, as sc scholars refer to as Q. This was the primary source that Matthew came, that Luke and, and John. One thing that Bertrand Russell did critique was, yes, the second coming, but Bertrand Russell in the same book also critiqued the historicity of Jesus. Um, and I just believe that I'm currently persuaded that perhaps maybe this is a myth. And, and coming from somebody who was born and raised in a very zealous denomination, somebody who gave uh, all of his 20s, I'm 34, by the way, I gave all of my 20s to the ministry, I gave all of my 20s to, um, you know, Bible college and seminary, and, and truly believing that we were in the last days, um, I, I, I'm going towards that road that maybe Christ uh, and the historicity of, of what we're reading um, is, is questionable. I'm just not an expert at this moment to go ahead and um, um, thoroughly, thoroughly, uh, you know, bring the evidence to that. But I hope I, I hope I answered your question. Right, and that was a that was a fair answer. And uh, I know that IOs had had quite a bit of spread on the internet. Is there any scholarly material that say someone can refer to that maybe supports this position, or is this something in it? Is this more in embryo within the internet communities, or is it something that is kind of segued into into scholarship? I don't know of any uh, scholars uh, that have written any books. Um, definitely, no mainstream scholars would, you know, ever you know, compose such material, but now to, to, to my understanding, you know, I know that the Hebrew Israelite movement, um, I don't believe they've produced any credible scholastic compositions neither, but the His Israel, uh, Hebrew Israelites, that's a movement that's happening. And they are saying that they are the scattered 12 tribes, that they are, you know, part of this descendant, blah, blah, blah. And I would just say, okay, where's the science behind it? Where, where's the DNA that, that shows that you're part of, Ephraim or you're part of Benjamin or whatever have you, you know, there's no geneal genealogical record that any Jew has that can go before 70 AD. Um, they can only trace their roots so far. There's no genealogical record before 70 AD. So um, I, I hope I, I hope I address the question. Right. So, so suppose that they're an Orthodox Jew, someone who, who believes now that he's of that, that lineage, how would you answer his 
I guess, critiques of Israel only. For instance, suppose he came to you and said, hey, look, you know, my, my ancestors, um, you know, they suffered in the concentration camps in World War II, and they've got the, you know, the tattoos to, to prove it. And, right. you know, why would, why would Hitler have, you know, persecuted the wrong people? Why would he have had a false understanding? I mean, you, you know, you read Western history, and I'm not trying to take a position either way. I'm just saying, when you read Western history, you see a lot about the Jews. You know, the Jews are persecuted by this Christian king, by that Christian king. And there's been a, there's been an under, a dark undercurrent throughout Christianity of anti-Semitism. And I think the Roman Catholic Church has, um, you know, corralled around within the last few years and it's just, you know, started condemning their, their past position on the, you know, on the people of Israel. So what would you, what would you, if you were the representative of IO and uh, you were say in, in a council with other Christian theologians, what would be your position on this? How would you explain the Auschwitz? How would you explain that? Uh, well, I would first say if the God of Israel was still applicable today, why didn't God come through and save his people like he did before? If dispensationalism was true. Um, I mean, why? I think, I think you're, you're, you're questioning why the anti-Semitism throughout church history up until this present time. I mean, look, uh, ma many Christians throughout church history didn't like uh, the Jewish people because they crucified Christ. I mean, even Martin Luther was somebody who was deemed as anti-Semitic based upon his writings. I, I could be mistaken on that, but from what I've read, um, it seems to be something that's anti-Semitic. Why? Well, because God's done away with the Jews. It's, it's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free. Now we're the church. We're, we're kind of like the replacement, so to speak. So they're the ones who crucified Christ. They're going to hell anyways, because they're not being baptized. They're not receiving the Holy Spirit. They're not entering into the new covenant. Um, so maybe perhaps it's Christian superiority. Um, but all I know is that it's been chaos all throughout church history. And I don't see God bring in a prophet like he did with the Old Testament saints, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, somebody with true prophetic insight that could talk about the fall of a, an empire, the fall of a government. It's going to take place and then boom, it happens. Something that that we see as a true biblical prophecy that's actually fulfilled. I don't see a true prophet all throughout church history to come and organize the Protestants who are going to war, the Jews who are being persecuted, the different religions throughout all of the world. Um, I, I just don't see God active at all in humanity. Um, I'm not saying that I'm an atheist, but I, I do believe that deism is warranted. Um, when you look at the crimes against children, you look at children being born uh, with physical impediments, mental impediments, and, and are we to believe that because Adam ate a fruit, that God is bringing mass punishment to the entire human race because of Adam eating a fruit, which then makes you question on whether or not, you know, Adam is actually historical in itself, which me personally, I don't believe that the uh, Genesis account is at all historical. I do, by historical, I mean that it actually took place in the way that it states that it did. Um, I just believe that it's uh, it's like a tale like folklore, like a legendary hyperbolic uh, mythological narrative of their history. And it starts off reflecting the Hebraic religious system. The seven days in creation, the Lord rested on the seventh day, of, uh, which was to, supposed to reflect the Sabbath. But you really don't have Yahweh resting because the Lord never sleeps nor slumbers. But here he's resting. Uh, here in Genesis 3, the serpent is eating dust all the days of its life. The serpent has a seed. And, and you know, Irenaeus was the one who actually declared that Genesis 3.15 was the prophecy of Messiah. You don't have any New Testament author saying that. But you have these relative stories of Israel's beginnings. And that's how I look at, at the book of Genesis. Um, so, yeah, that's I hope I, I answered that question. There have been a lot of people who have stated rightly or wrongly that a lot of um, Israel only adherents are have sort of veered towards atheism or agnosticism. Do you think yeah. that's fair? Do you think that's a fair assessment or is that like an ad hom sort of position? Um, I haven't done like any consensus, you know, but I, I would say that from ones I've spoken to, yes, they have become either deists. Um, some have become atheists. Yes. Um, 
you can believe in a lot of things of existentialism and reality. I think this is where philosophy comes in because <clears throat> Bible theology doesn't really talk much about the afterlife, the nature, the purpose of it. The Bible does not talk about the existence of evil within human ontology. Um, you may have this one passage, the Lord says, I, the Lord created evil, you know, I form light, I create darkness. But why? What was the purpose? Why does why do animals eat each other? You know, why are animals cruel? There's so many of them. And definitely uh, it wasn't because, you know, the fall of Adam, because nowhere in the Bible does it state that because the fall of Adam. Now, animals are become evil now. Um, you look at. Uh, I mean, you can look at so many aspects uh, of of how the scriptures are not applicable today. And I just I just feel that, yes, it can lead to atheism. It can lead to agnosticism. It, it, you can't. You can believe in the simulation theory. Maybe perhaps we're in a simulation. You can believe in, you know, Darwinian evolution, that, that when we die, uh, we just go back to non-existence, perhaps, like Epicurus declared. You know, these, these questions about the purpose of life, where do we go when we die, those are questions before Jesus came. Um, Aristotle, Socrates, Plato. I mean, even till, till this day, you have philosophers that are still pondering on this, but that's something that Bible theology does not address. I think the only thing uh maybe perhaps ecclesiastes sort of address like the details of the meaning and the purposes of life you know the emptiness of going after riches and all these and there's only 12 chapters i i think that people who, who who are looking for a philosophical answer for the purpose of of life the meaning of life where do we go when we die i mean you, you'll find it more in the world of philosophy i think arthur schopenhauer um is like ecclesiastes part two three four and five I mean, I, I read Arthur Schopenhauer. I see a lot of uh, uh, what Ecclesiastes states, but more uh, because he was written to a more modern world, more modern society. So I, I think that, yes, it is true that IO adherents, yes, agnostics, atheists can be true. Um, or you can believe that the God of Israel is still within humanity today with the true Christians. Now, the question is, who are the true Christians? And when you have over 50,000 denominations, um, where is the prophet to come and organize this? Why isn't God coming down and organizing this somehow, somehow, whether metaphysically or sending a prophet, whatever have you? Um, yeah, so that that's that would be my take on it. How do you think um, Israel only would respond to, say, Islam? Because Islam has some of the same, I guess, some of the same um undergirdings as does Christianity with, you know, the Old Testament narrative history and, and all of that. And uh, they're taking, of course, the, the, the scriptures uh, in their in their literal sense, and so, well, at least some of the scriptures in their literal sense, but then they apply it to, they've got another history on top of that. So how do you think, do you think that the fact that Christianity is perhaps a false or at least a um, a misunderstood or perhaps fallacious narrative. Do you think that has any implications on Islam, or do you think Islam can kind of hold its own against, uh, I guess, <laughs> against against IO as well? Well, at least in the gospel accounts, they at least claim to have coherent verification. You know, we were eyewitnesses of Jesus, and not just us, but look, all these hundreds of people as well. Uh, with Islam, the origins of it is extreme relativism. Here is this man, he goes into a cave, he thought he was hearing demons, his wife tells him, no, you're hearing, you know, God, you're hearing angels, and without the ability to write, he somehow writes verbatim, uh, that, that's divine dictatorship, I think is what we call it, hermeneutics, like the, the, the spirit or this divine agent is, is going into his cognition, and he's writing everything that he wants him to do, and that's just extreme relativism. Um, then he says that the New Testament is is not credible, that Judas was the one who was crucified and then all these things. I don't I don't really know how the the truth of the origin of Islam started, why uh, Muhammad would try to negate the New Testament scriptures, to be quite honest. Um, I just don't I don't believe that anybody truly knows unless they find some sort of diary uh, that shows Muhammad's intentions. I just don't think that we can prove his intentions that. I wouldn't know the the one hundred percent specifics on how Islam even came to be, other than what we read in history. I just wouldn't know why the intentions of starting a a, a religion um, based off of a New Testament, which they declared, you know, some parts are true, some parts are. Jesus was born of a virgin, but he's definitely not divine. He was just a prophet. And then, you know, they say, oh look, John sixteen 
Jesus spoke of Muhammad. He said, when this comforter will come, he'll lead and guide you into all truth. And they come and they say, he's talking about Muhammad. Now, when we apply audience relevance to that, you just say, well, then who was Jesus talking to? Who would see that Muhammad? Let's say he was talking about Muhammad. Who, who was going to see Muhammad? And if we hold to what full preterism, the, the, the logic that full preterism has, that I believe IO has as well, is a strong audience relevance. If he was talking directly to them, there's no breakage in space time within their language and bringing it to a different dimension of space time then that means that Muhammad had to have come in their lifetime for them to see it. And we know that Muhammad didn't come until 500 plus years later. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I just believe that if Islam is a false religion and there are billions of people who believed in it, that I just don't believe God is a respecter of persons and there are other humans that can believe in a false religion too, even within Christianity, Allah, the Roman Catholic Church. Right. Do you feel that the, the Greek philosophies uh, the Greek philosophical systems that were, say, in vogue 500 years before Christ, do you think that those can still be today a, um, a, uh, a good alternative for, say, modern mainstream Christianity? Or would you say that there's all religion pretty much and all philosophical systems are all at a, at a, at a base level? Or do you think that the older uh, philosophical systems can still compete, say, with Christianity? By compete, I wouldn't know if, if it competes. I know many Christians who would read the Stoics and still gain, you know, some some substance from the material that they wrote. Um, me personally, I, if I wouldn't know philosophy and have studied philosophy and been intrigued with philosophy, it would be very difficult for me to arrive to the I.O. conclusion. Um, because within my brain and my paradigm, I wouldn't see outside of theology. Like I couldn't see outside of the Bible paradigm, like, you know, other alternatives of why the, uh, the world exists, you know, <laughs> the laws of physics and, you know, the meaning of man and all these philosophical investigations. Um, I, I would say that philosophy definitely has helped humanity, um, I believe that science has also helped humanity. I just don't believe that Bible theology has contributed to humanity the way that philosophy and science has, historically speaking. And we can see it in our technological age. We can see it through medicine. Um, and we're watching it progress right now. I mean, back in the ancient times, we're living in a magical world. Just turn on a faucet, boom. Bible theology didn't give us that. Now, you could have said, well, there were Christians who were motivated, you know, to from, from the Bible to find out these things. That's fine. Um, Islam, the same thing. I mean, uh, when we study history, we see that when Constantinople was taken over, it was the Muslims who preserved the Greek philosophers, the manuscripts, and then they had a boom of science during that time. Um, I just believe that science and philosophy can definitely not be an alternative, but be a, a contribution as, as, to the meaning, the purpose, fulfillment of life. Where do we go when we die? those philosophical questions, because I, I just believe that that's the, that's the conclusion. Well, what about us? You know, full predators, well, what about us? How is it? I don't, I don't understand it. And if I could just make this, this one comment here, sin, for example, somebody says, well, sin still exists. Sin still exists. Sin. But the thing is, is that sin is not the same thing as evil. Sin is only found in the Bible. That word sin is a Hebraic term. That was exclusively given and known from the Israelites. There's, there's not a built-in mechanism in every cognition that knows that word, sin. Like if I were a, 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 from another island and I come to you and I say, hey, you pachow, you pachow against my deity. You go, what's pachow? Like, well, pachow means you violated my deity's laws and statutes and requirements. And you would say, well, I don't even know your, your God. I have no... Uh, uh, no knowledge of the laws, the nature, don't even know. But but somehow I put out. You see, it's just a very foreign word. And but yet you're imposing that I'm guilty of that foreign word. That's exactly how sin is. Sin is only a Hebraic term. And the reason why people in the Western world are equating sin with evil is because the colonists came and brought the, the text over here to the Americas and now it's became part of our culture. But that word sin is not a universal word that the majority of humanity would even know. Sin is only tied to Yahweh. In, in short, if I were to bring a, a, a synopsis, sin is only a, 
Yahweh term. It is only a Hebrew Israelite term because we only find it in the Israel scriptures. We don't find that word sin anywhere else. Um, and so that would be uh, my, my conclusion to that. Do you think IO is going to grow? Do you think it's a growing movement right now? Do you see it picking up speed, uh, making headway in the, perhaps not in the evangelical world, but at least on the internet among evangelicals or post-evangelicals, particularly of uh, full preterists and the like? Do you see it making headway? Do you see the movement growing? What is your forecast for the future of the IO system? I do see the IO system growing so far as full preterists are growing. And I, I've written this on Dog's page. He's written to me back and forth. Um, I've said, look, as long as full preterism begins to advance, IO will always be in the shadows. It will always be like, well, we're the true version, or this is the true way to interpret it, because it's only a matter of time that people are going to start to say, well, what about salvation? What about the need of the gospel? I'm still born under Adam's curse, and I still need to be redeemed. Uh, but yet you're saying all things are fulfilled. I think that if the if the right person were to be the voice of IO, that would kind of spark the fire. Like, for example, let's say um, Rabbi Tovia Singer, you know, he's a, a, a Jewish apologist. I think if he understood the IO paradigm, since he's against the New Testament, he wants to debate the New Testament, then I think that if IO ever came into the hands of somebody who was already well known, then that could possibly, you know, but it's just a very unpopular message in, in Christianity. And I get it. Um, I, I've, I've said this before, but full preterism, when I first heard full pre preterism, it disgusts me. Uh, and I, I say it, it touches the insular cortex in our brain that expresses disgust and rejection and negativity. And, and that's essentially how I felt. But that doesn't mean that it's false. Um, but yes, I do see it uh, definitely um, uh, spreading. I just, I just don't see any time soon, but I, I would contribute the main spokesperson uh, would be Jason DaCosta. I think that Jason DaCosta has done a lot of work. And if anybody should deserve some credit, I think that Jason DaCosta should deserve the credit to at least have articulated the IO view and put in, I, I would, I would say the scholastic work in it, because he's definitely somebody who's well-learned um, in full preterism. You know, Don Preston even helped publish a book for him. Um, you know, and I, I see that he, he's the one that would definitely be very good in a, in a debate. I think that if it's a formal debate, um, then IO would, would definitely, uh, I believe that nothing could be IO in a formal debate. That's just my opinion. I think that IO just has too many scriptures, too much logic, and I want to say too much science, um, because I just don't believe that it is just linguistically warranted, scientifically warranted to divide the all of the discourse or to apply anything in the scriptures um, that we read to that audience today. That's just how I view it. Right. And uh, suppose somebody came to you and said, well, you know, I saw this podcast that you did uh, with Phelan McPhailin, and I'm interested in learning more about the IO position. Are there any books out there that I can go to? I don't have time to, you know, watch a hundred <laughs> podcasts. Are there any books or any materials that I can get that the many introductory volume or something that's out there on the market already that's a good introduction to the IO view? Or would you kind of kind of move through the through the system, watch <laughs> a lot of podcasts and take a lot of notes? How do you Yeah, do I, I I understand the, the lack of scholastic sources with the IO view. Uh, I do believe that there is one man who did compose a book recently I, or that has something to do with the Israel only view. I could be wrong or he was in the making of it, I, but I haven't heard of any, uh, any book or any scholastic article that somebody can go to. So if somebody comes to me and says, I'd like to know the IO view, I would first direct them to full preterist materials. And I would say, okay, here's what the full preterists say regarding the time statements. I think that's one thing that IO and full preterism um, has in common is the time statements. And if we can see that the time statements was, you know, for them and not into a different dimension of time and space that happens spiritually through the volume of a book, um, then once they come to understand the full grips of full preterism, then I would say, but the resurrection was intended to be physical. Don't listen to Don on that. <laughs> um, the rapture is not some sort of like allegorical catching away that it was intended to be the dead ones being raised with those that were alive and remain. They were to be caught up to meet with Christ in the air 
into a spiritual kingdom that was not made with hands. That spiritual kingdom would be a new Jerusalem, a new heaven, a new earth, so to speak. So I would guide them through, um, do Don Preston's, uh, all of the discourses, I don't know, three or four or 500 videos that he has and see how much they could grasp from that. If I think that if anybody understands the full preterist paradigm, then they essentially understand the IO paradigm, even if they want to reject the notion that the Gentiles were scattered Israelites. I would say otherwise. I, I would say that IO upholds that the scattered Israelites being regathered is the focal point, is the focal eschaton that Jesus came for. That was the ministry of Christ. And we just believe that was the ministry of the apostles as well. And if that did not come into completion in 70 AD, and that means that the mission for scattered Israelites to be regathered has to be on the forefronts of every Christian denomination today, because that's part of the mission. That's part of the, they're part of the elect. They're part of the diaspora, but they're somehow still scattered out in the nations today. So, yeah, so I would direct them to Don Preston. If they understand full preterism, then I would just simply tell them it was all for the first century. Everything was for the first century. And if they say, well, prove it, I would say, OK, staunch audience relevance. Where are you and I specifically in the text? We are not specifically addressed. America is not specifically addressed in the text. The futurists say, oh, that's because maybe one day America will be taken over or America's going to fall. That's why it's not mentioned in Daniel's 70th week. Well, it's not mentioned because they didn't know geography. Their uh, knowledge of the, of, of the planet was very, very limited. So the known world was very, very limited. Um, so when they preached the gospel throughout all of the world, it was only the known world that they that in 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 context. So America is not mentioned. We're not mentioned. So this we cannot look at the Bible as any other historical or a mythological narrative. If we just read it like it was all applied to them, if we would treat it like we would any other book. Now, and I, I still think about this every day. I mean, what other book do we read where we divide? language into a different dimension of space time. I cannot think of one historical book where he's talking to them and without any explicit statement of talking to another audience, somehow he intended to do that. I just don't see any other literature. And to me, uh, epistemically speaking, that's relativism. That is a private interpretation, so to speak. And I just believe that in order to have obtain justified true belief, you do need coherent verification. You do need other minds to come and see if that's true. You need other scriptures to come and see if that one passage of scripture that you're saying is true. Well, are there other scriptures that could come and verify that? So that that's my take on it. I apologize for for my uh, my son over here. He's that's just fine. acting that. I wanted to ask you, Tristan, what's your take on flat earth? There's a lot of full preterists. I think it's a growing number of full preterists who do hold that the Bible writers believe that the earth was flat, that they were teaching ancient Mesopotamian, you know, views of, um, of geography. What do you think about that? Do you think that there's a, there's any kind of advantage toward, uh, toward holding that view? Or do you think that that's just not a, not a correct position to take? I, I don't believe that it's a correct position. I, I'm not, I wouldn't know. I haven't been up into space. I mean, so I have no justification. I just rely on what NASA states. I just rely on what, you know, the scientific stores, sources have stated, whether those are credible or not, I wouldn't know. I mean, there are times, to be honest, I go, man, am I, am I in some sort of simulation here? What is happening? You begin to question reality as a whole uh, when you get deep in, and it's fun. I mean, it, it really is fun uh, looking at the different perspectives of, of what possibly could be true could the earth be flat you know maybe i just wouldn't see any scholastic scientific sources that would that would state that and if it was i just don't think how that would be irrelevant to any view in my opinion i mean even even if the earth was flat and we've all been lied to or mistaken i just don't think that have, would have anything to do with the new testament narrative or you know the god of god of the bible being in existence today all right. So what are your future plans, Tristan? Anything, any any ministries getting off the ground? I know that you went to seminary and I mean, you've had a history of being, you know, involved in church ministering, but I know you don't want to do that anymore. But do you have any any teaching ministries that you're getting off the ground or anything you'd like to tell people that, you know, are you are you writing a book or what do you what are your plans for the future? You know, um, well, I'm currently a teacher. I teach uh, seventh and eighth grade history. So with my seminary degree in theology, I was able to become, you know, a credential teacher. So, you know, I, I really don't have many uh, aspirations. You know, I started a, an Instagram page 
uh, maybe like three years ago. It was for, for the same purpose of, you know, I would make posts, you know, that interesting questions and people would follow. It was just a page. It was called Theology Discussions. It was just a page just for discussions. And I gained a substantial amount of followers, a lot of interaction. As a matter of fact, that was also one of, uh, one of the ways I became a full preterist. Somebody introduced full preterism to me. And I had them on a live stream, just like how we're doing now. I never heard of full preterism. And he was explaining to me, and it just didn't make sense at all. But then I began to, you know, read more. I, I just don't have any aspirations for, um, you know, quote, ministry uh, within the church or, or anything like that. But I do very much enjoy Bible dialogue. I mean, it is just a number one passion of mine. I, I enjoy it as, as uh, I, I would say, just like any person would enjoy a sport or anybody would you know enjoy something that you know they like to do so um yeah maybe i was thinking about maybe uh having a little youtube channel about tithing you know i'm really passionate about that doctrine i believe that it is a, a, an erroneous doctrine i believe it's been robbing humanity um since the council of macon in 586 a.d was with new testament tithing you know you have a lot of pastors telling saints if you don't give 10 percent of your money you're robbing god applying malachi 3 to them you know and I, I did think about doing something like that it's just time it takes a lot of time you know given over 10 years of my life to ministry and bible theology you know it's kind of just kind of finding that maybe when i'm inspired i'll think of doing something but i, I purposely don't have any intention of being a voice person for io or anything like that i just came across your channel i found it as a breath of fresh air always wanting to see something new, to hear something new. Nobody that I know in my world knows about this or even wants to hear about this. All of my Christian friends, I mean, they don't want to hear about full preterism. They're certainly not going to want to hear about IO. So yeah, I mean, that, that's pretty much it. I'm just, uh, I'm in the happiest stages of my life. Um, and, and that's it. I, I just don't believe that if somebody becomes IO, that that's it, it's over. You have to be an atheist or now you're going to be unhappy for the rest of your life. There's no meaning, there's no purpose. I just, I just me personally, I, I haven't felt that at all. I still have the same dopamine being released when I'm talking about the scriptures. I still have the same serotonin in my body that's being released when I'm talking about Bible theology. So that's, that's just how I view it. I'm, I'm just a humanitarian just who enjoys and is addicted to Bible theology. Right. That's wonderful. Do you have any last words for our viewers or any any words, any um, anything you'd like to say to those who may be watching this video? I, I personally would like to thank you. You know, I, I, I find your channel just to be, like I said before, a breath of fresh air. I mean, just, you know, going on Don's channel every day on morning musings, I, you know, you just run into the same crowd, you run into the same objections or you don't get any answers at all, whatever have you. But, you know, just coming across your channel and it, it's it's just it's very beneficial. And I, I think you're doing a great work um, for Christianity, for the for the full preterist movement, just for scholarship as a whole. And uh, anybody who's who's listening, I would say that those who are IHO adherents, that they're genuine. I don't believe that there's any ulterior motive. These are just humans who have a motive to understand the scriptures. I mean, most people who study the Bible, they're not getting any money out of it. This is something that we just like to do because we're fond of it. We have a predilection towards the scriptures. And I believe that those who believe in IO, um, that, that they're sincere and whether or not they believe, you know, in agnosticism or atheism, whatever have you, I don't believe that that is at all pertinent to interpreting the text. I don't believe that somebody needs to be a Christian to interpret the text correctly. And I think anybody could just read the text and cognitively understand the narrative of the story. I don't believe that somebody needs a supernatural Holy Spirit to come and you know enable their cognition to understand the propositions in the text. So um, yeah, I just believe that the IO view in, in, in a formal debate, I believe there's just too many weapons. I mean, we've barely scratched the surface. I just think that IO has um, a cohesive, concise understanding of the New Testament. And it's pretty much just full preterism and just making that next step to state, well, then it's no longer applied. If all things are fulfilled, then that, that means all things are fulfilled. Adam's curse is done away with. The, the curse of the Mosaic law, which was, it, which was the same thing, according to I.O. view. It's, there are two constituent elements, Romans 5, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, there is no gospel mission and there is no salvation. Uh, because Jesus's blood was shed for those under the first covenant, you and I or nobody else was under that covenant. Um, and so, I mean, there's, 
there, there's there's a lot of uh, arguments I, I would say that would hold valid in a formal debate, and I'm just hoping to see um, a formal debate between a full preterist and an IO adherent because. To, to me, I would just be sitting back eating the popcorn, just enjoying it, you know. But if I O is wrong, I O is wrong. If full preterism is wrong, full preterism is wrong. I just don't believe that those who uphold the I O view are evil, um, agnostic, stay away from them, don't listen to them. I just think that, look, if, if somebody's a Christian, it's their duty to slay the gainsayers. It's their duty to go out and, you know, the word of God is for correction, for edification, for righteousness. You know, you're supposed to go out and, and you know, attack the heresies, you know. And correct them in front of everybody, rebuke them, and and bring people the right doctrine, you know. So I just hope that Dom Preston the, addresses I.O. specifically. I hope that Dom Preston uh, does an audio of I.O., like a morning musing, like a series addressing uh, the I.O. viewpoint. Because as long as full preterism begins to rise, I believe I.O. will always be in, in the shadows of it. So that's just my take on it. Okay. Well, that was a wonderful video, a wonderful interview, Tristan, and I enjoyed having you. And we'll try to have some more I.O. adherence on. I think we've got Corey Schultz coming on next month. And I also did reach out to Rivers of Eden. Uh, okay. Maybe with him. He's probably going to be coming on after Corey Schultz. So we'll have some more I.O. teachers on to, uh, to help explain the, the theology. And uh, in the meantime, thanks again, everybody, for watching this. Thanks again for your thoughts, your comments, your observations. Lance is going to be back next week. We hope to have another one. I don't know who's coming on. He's got a lineup of his own that he's, he's sort of uh, uh, dealing with right now. i got an uh, Eastern Orthodox uh, person coming on, I believe. And then there's another guy. He, I think he may be an agnostic uh, or an atheist. He's going to be coming on. May not okay. be next week, but it's going to be a couple weeks from now. So... Hope everybody stays tuned. In the meantime, thanks again for watching. Have a wonderful evening and we'll talk to you soon.